Hey, this is Florian, online tennis instruction. Have you ever lost a very important match because you just didn't play well under pressure and maybe you even choked? Possibly you played a big club tournament match or even worse, you lost a very important league match and let your teammates down. In those situations, we get nervous, then we lose our focus and then things just go downhill from there. I've certainly been in that situation myself and it feels absolutely horrible, especially when we know that we could have won that match if we had played up to our full potential. Now, as you know, this can even lead to dreading upcoming matches. There is, of course, a lot of advice out there on the mental game already, and possibly you've read some books and maybe even tried working with some of the online programs available. Yet somehow you're still struggling with this problem and you're not playing well under pressure. The problem with most of the standard mental game advice out there is that it does not get to the root of the problem and therefore it does not give you a long-term solution. The interesting thing is that every tennis player struggles with this at some point in their career and it even happens at the highest levels of the game. So today I'm very excited to introduce you to Jim Grab, who is the newest member to the OTI instructional team and together we are going to show you a solution to this problem. Now Jim faced these kinds of high pressure situations many times throughout his career as a professional tennis player. He was ranked number one in the world in doubles and as high as number 24 in the world in singles. Jim also holds an economics degree from Stanford and he worked for over five years on Wall Street. So he certainly knows what it means to perform under immense pressure and nowadays he specializes in helping tennis players like yourself overcome these kinds of mental letdowns. Now Jim actually lost one of the biggest matches of his tennis career in the Wimbledon doubles finals against no other than John McEnroe because he choked on some of the crucial points and he didn't play up to his full potential under pressure. But I'm going to let Jim tell you that story himself. Florian, thanks for that introduction and thanks for reminding me that I uh, choked in the uh, finals of the Wimbledon doubles way back when. So that, uh, that year was 1992 and uh, we, my partner Richie Renenberg and I were playing, as Florian mentioned, in the Wimbledon doubles final against John McEnroe and Michael Stieck. Now, uh, John McEnroe is, in my opinion, or was, in my opinion, the best doubles player of all time. Uh, and uh, we used to joke that John and anybody would be number one in the world. And that year he happened to be playing with a former Wimbledon singles champion, Michael Stieck, who was an incredible player, a wonderful server, a great shot maker. Uh, and we knew, even though they weren't necessarily ranked real high be as a team because they hadn't been playing together, we knew that they would be the team to beat that year. And indeed, they made it to the finals. We did as well. And, uh, and it's a funny story. This match went on on and on and on. It was played on the old court one, which is a beautiful old court that is no longer there, but it was the, the scene of epic uh, battles, uh, both Wimbledon battles and Davis Cup battles. And it was, we indeed followed suit and played another one of these historical matches. So this was an incredibly competitive match where the first two uh, sets were, excuse me, the first four sets we split. And as we worked our way uh, through this fifth set, it started to get a little darker more, uh, more and more difficult to, uh, to, put, to, find, to see the serve uh, for the returner. And it really became this uh, grind, and I think it got to about eight all in the fifth set. And at that point, the referee came out and let us know that it was too dark and that we would have to come back and play the next day. And as disappointed as, as we were to not finish it, I was still you know, in the Wimbledon doubles final with a chance to win this historical event. And I remember at the time, John uh, McEnroe wanting, he said, no, 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 let's, let's play a tiebreaker. He wanted to play a tiebreaker. And, um, and, and to me, it was, uh, it was too big of a deal, uh, too, too momentous of an occasion to uh, kind of um, uh, decide with sort of the coin flip nature of a tiebreaker. So, uh, I th he was in the minority, I think, and, and so we, we chose, I think the, the negotiation uh, ended with giving us a little bit more time to see if we could uh, finish the match, and, and we actually finished, uh, played some more games, and at 10 all in the third, it was almost pitch black, and the referee came out and said, that's it, fellas, come back tomorrow. So we came back uh, on the Monday, 
and we, we expected the club to be quite empty and, uh, and that we'd be playing in front of a few people. And, um, and it turned out that the club opened the gates and the, the, the match had received such attention the evening before that, that once again, court one was full and it was a fantastic atmosphere. NBC st stuck around to televise it on Monday. So we came back uh, the next day and at, at started the match at 10 all in the fifth set, not knowing if we would play two more games or however many more games. And so it was, it, it was at that point that I think uh, I started to have a thought or two that is really interesting to this, this discussion. And that is that I remember saying at various points, it wasn't a prevalent, it wasn't a thought that wouldn't go away, but it was just something that popped up every once in a while. Uh, on that Monday when we're, when we're playing this epic fifth set battle, the Wimbledon doubles final. And I remember thinking that I, I would say, I don't want to be the guy who looks back and remembers that I lost my serve to lose this historical Wimbledon battle. And like I said, it wasn't always there, but it kept popping up and it was in its own way incredibly insidious. And that is because at this time, so we know that all great performance takes place when we're in the present tense. It doesn't matter if we're on the, on the tennis court at Wimbledon, at the tennis court at the club, if we're in the operating room trying to perform some kind of surgery on somebody, if we're, if we're arguing something in a court case, wherever we are, all great performance takes place when our focus is on the present moment. And so if you dissect those words, the words in my thought, it was pretty wacky. You know, there I was at the most important, one of the most important points in my career, a huge match, when my focus needed to be right there, front and center, you know, watching the ball, planning tactics, communicating with my partner. When I needed to be there, I was instead off in the future, worrying about something that might have happened in the past. So that time element was just, I think, really distracting. And it just created enough tension in my body so that I didn't flow freely, I didn't think clearly, and I clearly, clearly did not play my best tennis on some really, really important points. So I had these negative thoughts that kept popping up from time to time ultimately creating tension and a lot of anxiety. And so we would end up getting to these critical points in that fifth set, and I just wasn't clear-sighted. I hesitated a little bit, and that little hesitation caused us to lose that match. I felt crappy about it. Had I had the skills, had I had some way to deal with the negative thoughts and the negative emotions and keep coming back to the present moment where the competition really was, I think the outcome of that match might have been very different. I might be sitting here today uh, talking to you as the 1992 Wimbledon doubles champ as opposed to a runner-up of, of an epic match that was played that year. Wow, what an interesting story. Now, I certainly never played at that kind of a level, but I could relate to that story, and I'm sure all of you listening could relate to that story as well, because we've all faced these pressure situations where these negative thoughts come up and they result in us not performing well under pressure. Now, let's contrast that feeling of being nervous and anxious and just not playing well under pressure to being in the zone. When we're in the zone, everything seems effortless. Time almost stands still and we're just executing our strokes without thinking much at all. In fact, that's one of the main characteristics of being in the zone is that thinking is down to a minimal level. Now, the big question, of course, is can we train our brain so that we can access that zone a lot more often? Jim and I will discuss this as well as why you're still struggling with underperforming under pressure despite having tried all of these standard mental game tips like using rituals, positive affirmations and even visualizations in the next video. Right now though, I would like to ask you about your own experience with underperforming under pressure and maybe even choking. When does this happen to you usually and what does it feel like? Please post a comment underneath this video and Jim and I will reply to as many comments as we possibly can and then make sure that you check your inbox in the next couple of days for that next video.